unlike other insects, a praying mantis will watch you more aware than you'd expect an insect to be. If you couple that with its intergalactic appearance, it could spook you. Eh, go ahead and enjoy your goosebumps, knowing you're bigger than they are. Their weirdness is part of why they fascinate us. That and their graceful deadliness. Take, for instance, their balance. It's a necessary component in their ability to kill. This praying mantis leans back and sways using only the legs on the back half of her body. You'd think the laws of physics would dictate that she topple off of that plant. Her gravity-defying secret lies in her feet. Now, they may look insubstantial, but they're flexible enough to curve around the edges of leaves and using her two tarsal claws, grip. And the feet have Velcro pads. No, actually, their pads are better than Velcro because ripping Velcro loose would take time. The mantis can't spare a millisecond when a bee's within striking distance. She has the bee before it knows what hit because her feet don't stick. The pads have tiny hairs, which adhere to a leaf a lot or a little, depending on how much pressure the mantis exerts. Once the pressure is gone, she's gone. Such control allows her, in this impossible pose, to dangle unconcerned, or to walk on glass. Her delicate forelegs look as graceful as a racehorse's legs, frozen in slow-mo. That's an illusion. The mantises we see in our Missouri garden can't race. They can't even really scamper. They rock tentatively toward any new location, like a blind person searching with a cane for safe footing. Mantises are themselves only a link in the chain of predation. If a bird, a snake, or a lizard wants her for a meal, she has to depend on camouflage, not speed. As for her spooky habit of rocking and swaying, the motion helps her with depth perception. Her eyes are not mobile in sockets like ours, so she has to move her head, same as owls do, to get a 3D fix on an object. And if that object is close, a couple of inches away, say, she can strike in the blink of an eye. Her forelegs are jackknives covered with spines that grab prey in a relentless hold, capable of easily crushing the hard shells of beetles and grasshoppers. She bites the prey's neck to paralyze it and begins eating while it's still alive. She'll only eat the freshest meat. No lean cuisine thought in the microwave for this lady. Eating raw meat without utensils is messy business, and she takes cleanup seriously, raising a leg like a violinist as she cleans each spine. Cat-like cleans her face, or combines both motions into one. Then she folds her forelegs with the spines meshing like a zipper and prays. Prayer? If that's what prayer's about, let me out of the church. Oh, we humans want life to be eaten, and this tiny creature, chewing on her still wriggling prey, personifies the cruelty of nature. The funny thing is, though, that we humans do more than our share of harm to the planet, while this creepy mantis works beautifully in nature's overall scheme.
Every night for a couple of weeks, a barn spider crocheted a new web in our sliding door. Most mornings she took the web down before dawn, but not always. A few times we got to see her intricate creations backlit by the rising sun. Here's Charlotte now. She closes the bottom left of the web first because her hidey hole is in the top right corner. The process resembles closing a series of zippers. Pardon us while we open the door to give you a clearer picture. Before Charlotte cleans up her kitchen for the day, she disposes of the leftovers. If footballs were teensy, she'd make a great place kicker. On this particular day, Instead of closing the zippers one by one, she opts for a Tarzan routine. Let's just pull this anchor over here loose and whee! The whole bottom half of the web floats in the breeze. Charlotte's headed upwards now, but she's about to turn around and start scraping white stuff off that strand. That's silk. Barn spiders, so named because they like building their orb-shaped webs in the doorways and windows of human dwellings, take down the web before it gets too tattered, and then they eat the silk and reuse it in the next web, which is 85 to 90 percent composed of material from the last web. Let's just lose this one last anchor here, she says, and then she heads for the hidey hole, with lots of white silk fuzz still on her nose. The hole looks like an abandoned mud dauber's nest. Good night, Charlotte. Or should I say, good day. Take me to your leader. You'd swear that's what it's saying, right? And you consider doing it, too, except that, as you can see on this mulch bed, the creature is only two inches long. But those eyes, they make it look intelligent enough to be E.T.'s cousin. Unlike other bugs that either ignore you or scurry away, a praying mantis watches you. Those mounds on each side of its head are compound eyes with dozens of lenses. The better to see you with, my dear. The black dots aren't its pupils. They're just diffracted light from one or another of the lenses. No, the mantis watches you with the entire eye. So if you're standing behind it, it literally has eyes in the back of its head, many of them, for watching you. And besides, it can swivel its head 180 degrees in case it wants the best possible view. Our brains couldn't handle dozens of images at once of all the objects around us. Our minds would balk at the Hall of Mirrors effect and shut down. But this mantis clearly sees the body of the cricket below its chin even as it tilts its head up to watch you. And if it looks down at its meal, rest assured it's seeing everything you do at the same time.
chandelier. Or it would be if it were a chandelier. But it's only a dewy spider web, complete with spider that spends her life hanging from chandeliers. Her web is one of three or four dozen of them, festooning a six-foot square bed of black-eyed Susans. So, except for being a dazzling, intricate creation, it's nothing special. These spiders, less than a quarter inch long, build themselves two-story homes. The bottom level, flat like a doily, protects the homeowner from home invaders underneath her. The top level, shaped like a bowl, is where dinner is served. As insects fly past the web, they have to be adroit enough to avoid all its anchors. Because the least little fender bender with one can send a fly plummeting down into the bowl. See if you can tell whether the spider feels the original impact when a fly caroms off an anchor, or whether it only spurts to the spot after the bug hits the bowl. Let's look at it in slow-mo. Whether she had a microsecond's head start from feeling the anchor tremble, or moved as the prey hit bottom, you'd have to agree that she looks jet propelled. And she sort of is. She moves her legs by shooting fluid into them. Jet fuel, I'd call it. And the teensy flies she catches are easy to pull through the interstices in the web. But bigger prey uh, require more effort. By September in Missouri, female bowl and doily spiders often find that a male has moved in on them, horning in on their prey and expecting other perks. And since spiders suck the fluids out of their prey rather than eating the meat, corpses litter the home, especially with two spiders in residence. Never mind the dead fly, just step around him. Kind of reminds you of a bachelor pad full of leftover pizza crusts and beer cans. Desecrating a million dollar chandelier. A native hydrangea plant is an expansive plain full of wildlife. A miniature zoo in our own backyard that we giants usually lumber past, oblivious. But a single flower, rocking and trembling in the slightest breeze, may host a dozen different species at a given moment. Bees, for sure. Like this bumblebee, with the pollen sacs on her rear legs looking pretty full. This honeybee, and sweat bees in iridescent green and plain brown. Notice that the bees have long antennae. Flies don't. But they do have a proboscis for sucking nectar. So do hard sheathed beetles, like this quarter inch long tumbling flower beetle. Or these, oh, pardon me. If these are soldier beetles, unabashed about who watches their sexual activities, because in fact, nobody is interested. Not even the female, from the look of it. Well, unless they get their antennae and legs tangled up. She's more indifferent than a woman staring at the ceiling because the female beetle continues to walk around and eat. In the midst of this Eden, predators lurk. A tiny praying mantis and a black-tailed crab spider. Seeing this webworm moth strolling by with its wings tightly rolled up, 
the spider hopes to grab it with his powerful front legs and immobilize it with one venomous bite. Now you may think it's pretty funny, him going after a creature that size, but his abdomen is sort of pleated so that it can expand. And besides, he isn't going to eat the flesh, just suck the juices out. It's more like having an extra large milkshake than a 10 pound steak. But in any case, the moth escapes. This lush, aromatic field, because it provides food to the bugs, offers as much sex and violence as a James Bond movie. <laughs>